Okay, I am recording now. Thank you. Okay, so may I will have the pleasure <laughs> of introducing Sun Yok, who is a friend, of course, was a postdoc for th two years, three years at CRM, I forgot, right? Two years. When was 2012? About that, two years that I remember, two years. Is... Yeah, it was it, yeah. some time ago, right? Yeah, yeah. Good times, I, we had good times together. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, and then he moved on uh, to seven postdocs and finally landed in the University of South Florida in Miami. And so it's a, it's a Great pleasure to introduce you, and uh, the talk will be about the asymptotics of average characteristic polynomials in Geneva ensemble with fixed point charges. Thank okay, you. so th thank you for invitation to Montreal again. Uh, so I will talk about uh, random matrix model, but a complex random matrix, so eigenvalues are complex. Um, okay, uh, so let, let me start. So uh, like in the usual random matrix, uh, eigenvalues can be viewed as a Coulomb particles in two dimension. So uh, our model is uh, Coulomb, -based. Coulomb particles. Uh, by the way, for some of you, uh, especially Ferenc and Marco, this talk will be uh, at least the first 30 minutes or more. It looks familiar a little bit, yes. Repetition. <laughs> And these are all the things, mostly what I learned from two years in Montreal. All the techniques are com coming from two years in Montreal. And uh, so we consider uh, N particles. You see, all, all the, they are particles in two dimensions. I use complex numbers, Z1 uh, to Zm. Let me choose different colors for uh, the location of the particles. And they are given by this probability density. Here I have uh, probability density is vanishing whenever there's uh, particles uh, collapse together. So it gives the repulsion between the particles. And each particle is uh, subject to this external potential Q. And we are interested in the characteristic polynomial of this uh, system, which means the polynomial whose zeros are at the particles. Of course, the particles are random, they distributed by this uh, probability distribution. Therefore, characteristic polynomial is also random. So I can take the expectation of the characteristic polynomial. Then this is not random, this Pn is not random, and we are interested in this polynomial, which is average characteristic polynomial. And what everyone knows, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, let me go uh, somehow. Why there's no, okay. So, uh, and I will talk about the special case where Q is of this form, it's Gaussian uh, plus logarithmic singularity. And this is more or less the, uh, all the possible global model where you can study the Coulomb gas because if you put, uh, you, so all, all the possible rational function, if you put a rational function or anti-derivative of the rational function there, that's more or less the full uh, algebraic possibility. But if you cannot put uh, rational poles or, or uh, any polynomial uh, that's growing more than degree three, because then it, the potential is not globally well-defined because at some direction, the potential will go to negative infinity and negative infinity is where all the particles will fall into. So then it's not well-defined. So these are more or less the full, um, all the possible potential that we can think of that we can define on the whole complex plane. And this is the example of the picture where we have three uh, log singularity. And then uh, I can give the charge for each log singularity. Then uh, yeah, for example, uh, this one has a uh, charge two. So you can see the other particles are a, a little distant from this point. And this charge is one. So uh, more or less distance by uh, the same distance as the other particles. 
And this one is, has given the charge minus one half. So it's actually slightly attracting. So some of the charge gets very, very close to this one, but actually uh, this minus one half is allowed. So as long as charge is greater than minus one, it's allowed. Okay, so what some of the things that we will not discuss, but we can do is that uh, if the two charges are uh, large, then it can push away most of the particles very far away. So um, the particles can draw. Uh, so in this case, the part, the, the shape of the particle support is uh, almost a disk, but uh, the disk can uh, deform into different shape. So particle will uh, only stay within this uh, strange shape. So here, this is the location of the two charges, for example, then particles uh, will all stay here, pushed away by these two particles. So this kind of thing also can be done you know, using the one that I'm describing. Okay, so we will uh, describe uh, the uh, Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, this is some other uh, uh, application of what we are doing. So uh, by calculating the partition function of the system, the Coulomb. Uh, so if I integrate this probability di uh, distribution, then we get the partition function. By calculating the partition function, that's equivalent to calculating the expectation of the uh, this. Uh, moment of the characteristic polynomial. So what I mean is uh, we define the characteristic polynomial by the uh, polynomial, and we take the power, uh, each one by uh, some power. So that's the moment of the characteristic polynomial. And then we uh, uh, calculate uh, the multiple moments uh, at various position, and then take the expectation. So why we are interested uh, in your, uh, when you when you're saying expectation is only the Gaussian expectation. So you're uh, not yeah, putting right. the uh, logs into the measure. Right here, this is the uh, expectation only with the Gini group. You're right. So this is a study about the Gini group ensemble in this case. So the previous example with the logarithmic singularity has an application to study the moment uh, characteristic polynomial of the Gini group ensemble. So this is. Uh, physically, what uh, what uh, what it states is the uh, if you uh, if you have uh, particles at this position a one a l so if you have a one a several particles with the particle strength c one and c two c three and so on then they will uh, repel with each other depending on this uh, uh, particle strength but uh, there. So we are interested in their um, their interaction, but if if we put these particles inside the junior bound ensemble, so if we have a lot of particles around as a background charge, then the interaction between these other particles will change because of this background um, particle cloud. And uh, how they interact, or what what is their interaction, is given by this. One. So that's. Uh, that's uh, forgot the terminology uh, in electrostatics. If you have background charges, then you get different screening. No, something screening. Yes, screen. You get the screening effect. Um, so basically, if you have a lot of background charges, then what you get is these particles do not interact. All the background charges absorb uh, this uh, effect of the charge, so th they act like uh, they don't know each other. And this conjecture is exactly stating this fact that they do not interact if there's a background charge. And this is a conjecture that we can prove uh, using uh, our model that, uh, that we attempt to prove. So this is so far proven for. L equal one if there's only single charge. And there's, um, uh, yeah, there's yeah, more, uh, uh, not so far. So, so far it's proven for two charges. So far it's proven for when there's two charges. 
And here is the proof. So when there's one charges, it's proven by uh, within one. And if there's a two charges, uh, then uh, yeah, Alfredo and Sim prove that they uh, behave like uh, this formula if there's two charges. And locally, if two charges are very, very close, so this is actually the calculation when one of the charges at x, the other charges at minus x, the two charge phase, then this is uh, giving you the interaction between the two charges. When they are very, very close, then this, this graph is given by the previous formula. But when these two charges are very tiny, uh, the actual plot is uh, different. The actual plot is uh, getting different from when the charges are far apart. And uh, th there we need a different, after different scaling, you get a different um, behavior for the short range interaction given by Tangere Fang. So uh, Samuel, could you say what is the conjecture that is proved for n equals for l equals two? Oh uh, yeah. So this is the conjecture. Uh, so this is the conjecture. That's the formula. Yeah, that's the formula. It's coming from uh, multiplicative chaos theory, which I, I don't know. So this, uh, but physically, this is just saying that this uh, after screening effect, the charges are not interacting. See exactly saying that, but. Uh, uh, but there's some part that's uh, also depending on speed. Uh, those constant part is uh, a little more addition. So this is unproven for number of charges greater or equal to three. So is there any is there any conjecture for a continuum of logarithmic charges? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't. I, I never thought about it. Because that's this. What is it called? Uh, Betty, what is it called? Subharmonic, the most general subharmonic. Yeah, you could put in a, an arbitrary charge distribution and then stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It would be okay, interesting. So then this uh, part should be written in some uh, integral. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. But oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Probably one can be formally interesting. But uh, it's just, I, I don't know what the continuum limit of something like that would be. Right. Uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, didn't think about that. Mm. Just, I think it's, it's maybe, maybe doable. Yeah, the last part looks like a, an energy, uh, some sort of like a double. Right, yeah, the last part is just the energy yeah. of those partic particles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to the uh, yeah, exponential yeah. of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Yeah. yeah, as I said, this is just saying that these particles are uh, not uh, interacting. So. Uh, yeah, but when they are short range, when they, the particles are very close, then even the screening effect is not perfect. So you get different thing when, when the particles are very close and that's what you get non-trivial thing. Maybe that's uh, the obstacle when you go to the continuum. So those, those effects are coming as a tiny bit five in the short range effect. And that's also, uh, that, yeah, that's the uh, Alfredo and Nick's uh, result. Excuse me, would you mind saying what, what, what are in the axes? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, what... ah, yeah, this X is, so I'm, I'm putting the particle at, uh, just for uh, simplicity, at X and minus X. Okay. And then calculate the expectation of this characteristic polynomial for these two cases, one charge here, mm -hmm. one here, and then calculate this thing. So charge is two in this case. And I calculated this expectation and expectation should follow the formula of this, this uh, previous formula. But the formula is given uh, this, this line, which is matching pretty well when X is far away, but when X is tiny, when X is close to the origin and their particles are close, then you start having the, this deviation. And this deviation is uh, the effect of not, not perfect screen, which uh, gives some kind of effect. So as you can see, you, this you need some local parametrics analysis to get this kind of thing. And when the particles the are written somehow in terms of the orthogonal polynomials with those measures, yeah, I, that's what I'm going to do. So Alfredo uh, uh, used, yeah, I'm, I'm going to use the uh, Riemann-Hilbert uh, method for this uh, case. 
but yeah, uh, work in progress. And Alfredo uh, and Nick, they consider uh, this so with only two particles, with only two uh, point particles, and these two point particles only allows integer strength. So C has to be only uh, integers. And I, what I can do more is I can put any number of particles there, uh, but I can still make two of them to be uh, close. And of course, that uh, have to be uh, universal regardless of uh, all the other particles. Uh, the local parametrics will be universal. So I can also obtain the same result when um, there are more number of particles. And also for arbitrary uh, particle strengths, it doesn't have to be integer, but any uh, real numbers greater than minus one. And also another thing uh, they found is when uh, the particles are far away and when they are moving away from the gene gram sample, so they are mo moving uh, at the boundary, then also the screening effect will not work. So uh, at the boundary, you get another deviation and there you, they get kind of a four, I think a four, yes. These are also open. We are uh, almost finishing up this kind of a five part from the four is still open, but I think similarly doable. So these are still, uh, since my, my results are pretty uh, uh, not sufficient to fill all the talks. So I borrow this from Nick Sims and Alfredo. So their uh, result is uh, for single uh, particles, uh, they obtain some. Uh, a function that goes to the kind of kind of four, yes, kind of four, and for double particles here they put the double particles, and then they get kind of a five. In both cases, they they require the charge strength to be integer, so that's what we can uh, I can generalize. So not integer, not I can put more particles there, so more more determinants. arbitrary number of determinants. Okay, so let me go back to the previous definition of, uh, go back to the polynomial. So polynomial that we consider is this uh, average characteristic polynomial. And this average characteristic polynomial is <coughs> known to be uh, orthogonal polynomial by Heine formula. It's orthogonal with respect to this measure which uh, uses using the same external potential that we define the Coulomb gas. In our case, the, uh, this is this part is giving you this one again, interaction from each uh, AI with the charge strength CI. Okay. So such uh, asymptotics of the planar orthogonal polynomial is uh, much less known than the counterpart with the orthogonal polynomial on, on the contours. And uh, these are so, sort of uh, the full known example of knowing that we know the asymptotics. Um, yes, and, and I want to extend this one into uh, adding arbitrary number of lowering of singularity. And th there's further general results uh, uh, about the asymptotics of the polynomials. Uh, this general result is for very general class of Q, but it's not completely a uh, general class of Q. You, you have some weird condition that it's very hard to check whether the potential is satisfying that condition. And once uh, the potential satisfies that condition, this asymptotics is working only away, far away from the zero. So you cannot find out where the zeros are using this result. Okay, so let me uh, describe the result. To describe the result for, uh, so to describe the result, I have to explain some uh, um, object. So first, the uh, Sego curve. Uh, Sego curve is given by um, trunk. Uh, so Sego curve is the asymptotic locus of the zeros, which I plotted in the, in the picture. When you truncate the exponential, exponential function, uh, 
yeah, exponential function. Exponential function doesn't have zeros, but if you truncate to a uh, Taylor extension, then if, of course it has zeros. But since exponential doesn't have zeros, which means if you truncate more and more, the zeros will escape to infinity, it goes away. So at the same time, you have to uh, scale so that the zeros are stay in the finite uh, domain. So this is a scale truncated exponential function. Then the zeros converges to this, this line. This, this line. These are single curve and it's given by this formula. So when there's only one charges, one, one charges, then uh, we found that the orthogonal polynomial uh, has the limiting zeros, which is given by the Sego curve. So the so Sego curve has the uh, constant one, but I sort of generalize the Sego curve into different constants. So depending on the constant, you can have different shape, like uh, this kind of shape, uh, different shape. So you, you can get uh, this Sego curve when the charge, this is actually when the, the left one is actually when the charge is outside the Gini Brown symbol. So when, even when the charge is outside the Gini Brown symbol, it still affects the uh, zeros of the orthogonal polynomial inside. And the right hand side is when the charge is exactly here. Okay, so now uh, this is the description of the same curve, but in terms of the uh, graph of three-dimensional uh, three dimensional graph. So again, the single curve is given by this equation and that equation, I can view it separately. So this part is the yellow in three-dimensional graph. This is the log of, oh no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> this part is the yellow graph, right? Log of Z uh, looks like this. And this part is, of course, the plane. Plane with, whose uh, slope, the direction is given in terms of this A bar, this constant. So this is a plane given by the blue. So this equation will be satisfied by where this blue plane meets the yellow cone. So this, the projection of this line will be the single curve. And depending on the constant, this curve can change. But there will be unique constants such that this curve exactly goes through this point A, A, J. That's the Sego curve that I'm talking about. So Sego curve can change. So the constant is chosen such that Sego curve is exactly passing through the point. And that's where the Sego curve is uh, defined. And that's where the zero, uh, the zero locus. So could I just ask? Are, is the equilibrium distribution one of these quadrature domains? Equilibrium distribution. This uh, this equilibrium distribution is, of course, uh, uh, okay. By <laughs> equilibrium distribution generates the uh, same logarithmic potential as the disk. So it's one case of uh, one case of balayage of the disk. Um, I'm not sure if I asked. Uh, so I, I'm, this is uh, I haven't done this for a long time, but there was this all of this stuff about uh, balayage and the quadrature domains and so on. Yes, and uh, and the, it all had to do with the shape of the. Uh, the equilibrium distribution, whether it was equivalent to whatever, to the distribution that would have been caused by charges that are uh, localized on some lower dimensional uh, a curve or something like that. Right, I think the, uh, so here, uh, this equilibrium, this, this is uh, the charge equilibrium density measure is uh, generating the same, yeah. It's, it's yeah. the balayage of the uniform yeah. field. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm mixing it up because there's, it's, it's uniform, right? If we didn't. Yeah, it's the, so what is the simplest uh, uh, such balayage? Of course, it's a, a single point at the origin. Yeah. But you can have uh, infinitely many uh, different ways of balayage uh, into one dimensional equilibrium measure, and this is one of them. 
Right, but the actual density is constant, I guess. No, here the actual, I mean, the, the one-dimensional density along this Lego curve, this is not constant. No, 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 uh, the two-dimensional. Ah, yeah, yeah, like on the disk is constant, yes. Right, okay, so I'm going to generalize this to multiple particles. So if you have three particles, then here is the picture. And now, since I explained the single particle case with the graph, the, the case with the three, is also very easy to explain. It's the same thing. So each one, uh, A1, A2, A3, for example, each one has own uh, plane whose uh, direction is determined by A1 uh, or AL. So you prepare L planes, each one given by A1, A2, A3, and so on. And you have to go move up and down this plane such that A1 is at the boundary of A1 plane, like here. A2 is at the, oh, so yeah, I should, I should write A1 here. So A1 is boundary at the A1 plane, like here. So this is A1 plane, then it's the Point A1 has to be exactly at the boundary of A1 plane. Point A3 has to be exactly at the boundary of A3 plane, and so on. So you move up and down the plane until every point is on the boundary of each plane. And that's uh, the Sego curve. And of course, uh, whether such curve exists, uh, those need uh, proof. And the unique ex existence can be proven. And in the proof, there's uh, such structure comes that each point, uh, so some of the point can be actually between those two plane, like uh, if two plane meets, then the boundary between two plane can be like this uh, line, straight line. So the point can be in the straight line. So whenever the point is on the boundary of its own plane, it will meet with another uh, plane, right? So uh, in such case, you can draw, draw the uh, arrow, from uh, its own plane to the point that, so it will uh, um, adjacent to another plane and another plane will be uh, hosted by some, uh, its own point. So I draw the arrow uh, to, to this adjacent point. So each plane has a point of its own whose direction is given by its own point. And whenever the point is on the plane, um, I draw the arrow to this adjacent plane, adjacent plane. Does it, does it make sense? So for example, this point, uh, this point gives the direction of this plane. But this point is also adjacent to another plane, which is this one. And that plane is given by this point. Because each plane is given by uh, uh, this A, A1 bar times Z, A, A L bar, bar times Z. So I draw the arrow. And if you look at this arrow, the arrow is always 90 degrees from, from the intersection. Arrow is always 90 degrees from the intersection. Whenever the point is on the boundary, then it's also 90 degrees. So I can order the point, each point, uh, somehow in, in, by in the tree structure. And that means uh, you can uh, find the point numerically one by one. First, finding this point by choosing uh, the height of this plane to find this point and successively. So successive numerical uh, uh, simulation is possible. And that's actually, so, that's uh, how I numerically find this picture and also how we prove the unique existence of such a uh, point. So uh, let me just show uh, the, the calculation in real time. Just for a change. So, so this is the mathematical file. So if I, uh, if I have four points, then this is the corresponding Sego curve. And if I move one of the points, then Sego curve uh, changes. 
and the yeah this case all the points are on the on the boundary but uh, yeah some of them can be uh, inside and another uh, fact is that at least one of them has to be on the boundary that's also Sorry, so could you just recall what is the definition of the cellular curve? curve? I am sorry. So uh, I'm now saying, yeah, I'm sorry. It's a multiple cellular curve. Multiple cellular curve is uh, all, all this process that I mentioned so far is what I mean by multiple cellular curve. So given log, log of Z and given A1 to AL, then this data, so it's a given L number of complex numbers, A1 to AL, then I define multiple cellular curve, which uh, determined by this L complex numbers. How do I do that? So I consider uh, each complex number gives complex plane, uh, some uh, three-dimensional plane, like, like here, we have three planes. And I adjust the height of this plane such that each point is exactly on the boundary of its uh, boundary of the plane. And such arrangement is unique. There's only unique height for, for each plane, such that each point is exactly on the boundary. Since it's unique, I can define it to be uh, whatever. So I call it multiple single curve because it's analogous to the single curve. But, but I guess I don't, I missed the point. So when you know the Sego curve, what, what is it telling you? Does it tell you what the uh, locus of the equilibrium distribution is? Oh, yeah, yeah. So once you find the Sego curve, then, yeah, uh, I didn't say the... Yeah, so this will be the... Yes, that's the next tra next next transparency. Up here. Yeah. So this is my better than proof that multiple single curve is exactly the locus of the zeros. So all the blue blue dots are uh, zeros, and they are exactly lining up on this white curve, which you cannot see very well. I hope you can see it. So it's all perfectly lining up in this case. So that's the answer thing. And the rest is the proof, the description of the proof. Is this the same as the Fekete points of the uh, orthogonal polynomials? Uh, no. Uh, Fekete points. Uh, no, those would be uniformly distributed on the uh... right. So uh, yeah, I don't know how to make a connection to the points. Uh, so there's no here, balayage. There's no balayage going on. This uh, for all this uh, multiple uh, this equilibrium measure is a kind of balayage of the disk. A certain uh, among the infinite way of doing the balayage of the disk. So if we placed the charge distribution around your, uh, I mean, at the location of these zeros, would that effectively produce, produce a potential that's equivalent? Yeah, outside it's log of Z because, uh, because uh, this is the, exactly the, uh, this is the graph of the equilibrium, uh, graph of the effective potential generated by the equilibrium measure. So outside is log of z. And whenever you have some uh, discontinuity in slope, you get equilibrium uh, measure, some measure, some line measure here. But otherwise it's uh, harmonic. So outside it's always same as the uh, logarithmic potential generated by the disk, which is log of z. But inside you get different possibility depending on these charges that I put. So you can put as many charges that you want. You, get, you can get crazy, uh, I mean, all the possible crazy uh, zeros of the polynomial. 
So that's the result. That's the uh, result. Is it uh, any question? Okay, I believe the next thing is uh, yeah, it, it's all still a result. Just um, just showing off. There's uh, it's a strong asymptotic result. So everywhere you get uh, uh, uniform asymptotics in any context subset. Okay, of of course there's all, all, also uh, some local behavior around each particles. So this point, the location of the zeros is a little uh, different. I mean, it's not, so if you zoom in here, uh, the particles will, will be uh, clock distribution, it will be uniformly distributed. But if you zoom here, then you get this kind of distribution. Depending on the charge, if the charge is one, then you get uh, like this, charge is two, charge is three, and so on. So here uh, I use the local coordinates such that uh, all these the lo local zeros are on the imaginary axis. And, uh, and you know, another interesting thing is the Sego curve was uh, tr coming from the zero locus of the truncation of the exponential function. And here the local zero uh, local zero limiting uh, asymptotics is given by the complement of the truncation of the exponential function. So you ex exponential function, you remove certain uh, first few terms in the truncation, then the rest uh, gives the zeros of the local uh, behavior, local behavior. Okay, so yeah, again, this is the same uh, picture that I showed. Uh, yeah, maybe if I have more uh, time at the, at the end, then I can describe more about how this uh, uh, relate to some, some other technical details. So first, let me go to the multiple. So how, uh, so from now on is the method. So first I want to change this problem of finding the orthogonal polynomial into uh, multiple orthogonal polynomials, the so polynomial that depending on uh, uh, measure supported on the contour, because polynomial supported on contour is much, uh, have uh, strong tools and uh, with respect to multiple measures. So by, by the way, one more just remark is we obtain the syntax of the orthogonal polynomial but that will be very, very useful uh, to calculate the partition function, asymptotic of the partition function that I uh, showed in the beginning. And also, uh, also it, it's a work in progress, but also we want to uh, find the local process. So limiting kernel using this uh, asymptotic of the orthogonal polynomial. So, okay, so here this orthogonal polynomial uh, is multiple orthogonal polynomial. So let me first describe what is the multiple orthogonal polynomial. Multiple orthogonal polynomial in this case is determined by L measure. Here L is the number of particles that I put. And uh, for each measure, you have N1 orthogonality for the first measure, N2 orthogonality for the second measure, and total, you have n orthogonality. And that will give you a degree n polynomial. And I use the notation p of vector n. And I need the vector notation here because each measure has a certain number of orthogonality assigned to each measure. And that's a vector. And each uh, measure is given by this crazy formula, which is just. Uh, uh, re-expression of this uh, two-dimensional integral, one, the, this uh, z bar part of the two-dimensional integral written in some uh, way. And I also use uh, this notation w of z, that's important object, which is exactly the effect of uh, L charges that I put. So A1, A2, A3, it vanishes with the charges from Ej. 
And this object is the, uh, it's where all the health coming. So if all the CJ is, is integer, then this object is not, a, not much a problem. It's an analytic function. So nothing, scared, nothing to be scared of. But if CJs are non-integer, then this object has branch cut. And we have to place the branch cut to do some uh, work. Or, of course, uh, final result should be branch cut independent, but we have to put, put the branch cut to start working. And um, that's the really the co most complicated part of the uh, paper. So yeah, we st stuck on the this part of the branch cut. So we finished uh, the work for the integer CJs uh, and then uh, took uh, another one and a half year just for this making this branch cut works for non-integer CJ. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, let me describe uh, the result first and then proof maybe when, when I have time. So our orthogonal polynomial in two dimension is equivalent to the multiple orthogonal polynomial that I described using L measure. And where this vector N has to be chosen in this way, most uniformly. So given N, if say N is nine, the degree nine polynomial, and if I place three charges, then what is the most uniform way to divide N? Three plus three plus three which means uh, our vector n is 3, 3, 3. So that's, uh, uh, so p, p of 9 is equal to multiple orthogonal polynomial of 3, 3, 3. And if n equal 10, uh, degree 10, then the most uniform way is 4 plus 3 plus 3. So um, p 10 will be equivalent to the multiple orthogonal polynomial of four comma three comma three. Of course, four can come at the second place, four can come at the last place. So we have three equivalent ways of describing the describing the same polynomial in terms of the multiple orthogonal polynomial. So once we change to the multiple orthogonal polynomial, the there's a standard way to change to Riemann Hilbert uh, analysis. So uh, most of you know that uh, just plain orthogonal polynomial will be given by two by two with my Hilbert problem with the jump matrix like that. If you have multiple orthogonal polynomial with this jump, uh, the measure given by this one, then uh, it will satisfy uh, L plus one by L plus one uh, Riemann Hilbert uh, problem where L is the number of charges. And the one one entry will be what we are looking for. One one entry will be the orthogonal polynomial. Okay, so the rest. Uh, uh, Sonia, yeah. could I just uh, intervene? <clears throat> this is, I mean, it's sort of foggy memory, but normally when you would expect in the in the complex plane that it's a d bar problem rather than a Riemann Hilbert ah, problem. Yes. So, and I know that there's somehow a fantastic way to transform it into a Riemann Hilbert problem. Can you just say a word about that? Uh, so, so about the plane, plane orthogonal polynomial, there's uh, some uh, approach or using, I mean, uh, there's a hope that we could use the d bar problem for the plane orthogonal polynomial. I think that didn't work. So, uh, so D bar problem was originally hoped for general method of attacking this plane orthogonal polynomial, but that was just uh, uh, some hope, and it, it doesn't work. And I, I think it, it will not work for some uh, reason. And this is the this case is just changing the orthogonal polynomial, plane orthogonal polynomial. Uh, into some uh, multiple orthogonal polynomial on the contour, luckily because the potential is uh, algebraic. So we could use some uh, Stokes theorem to change the area integral into the contour uh, integral. And, and then the, that's the trick. The, uh, the yeah, that's the trick. That's the trick that we can change the 
explainer or talking putting you into uh, this problem, but that's that's case by case. So we cannot extend this thing into uh, some general theorem. So given the potential, we have to work out the Stokes theorem, and uh, we cannot we cannot foresee what kind of multiple orthogonal polynomial it will came out before we do the hard work. No, there's no uh, way to see it in advance. So I can I can also describe such thing uh, in three slides coming from um, planar orthogonality to contour integral. Mm. Should maybe yeah should I should I yeah I, I will just explain that. So uh, so this is uh, starting from uh, planar orthogonality. So I have polynomial, which is uh, orthogonal to z bar to the power k for k less than n with respect to the planar measure. So this will be zero if k is less than n. And then, of course, this part contains z and z bar. And all the thing that contains z bar I changed z bar into s, all the thing that contains. So here, z my square is z times z bar. I changed z bar into s. And also here, this z bar to the k, I changed to s of k, s to the power k, and so on. And I integrate s and take the derivative. So that's doing nothing. So I integrate s from zero to z bar and then integrate by z bar. Therefore, all the s will turn into z bar by uh, fundamental theorem calculus. So that's, I didn't do anything, but now I can put this z bar on the whole integrand because the other parts doesn't contain any z bar. So I can put this z bar on the whole integrand. And whenever you have the uh, integration uh, with the Total integral, a total derivative in front, then you can change uh, the, uh, the integration one degree uh, less. So I can change into Cantor integral. Cantor, uh, so, by the way, uh, the, the full complex plane integral can be written as a large disk integral uh, where the radius of the disk going to infinity. And this, per, this strange uh, bent is because of this branch curve coming from W of Z, this uh, very, very bad branch curve whenever CJ is non-integer. So I put the branch curve in the radial way. This is just one way. So once you put uh, this way, then this area integral over this greenish area becomes Cantor integral applying the Stokes theorem. And this D, D bar will disappear. So you get to, uh, this Cantor integral. And of course, we want Cantor integral over the analytic measure because otherwise uh, the Riemann Hilbert method is not uh, immediate. We need D bar, D bar method. But, uh, but here, this measure is not yet analytic because I have Z bar here. Uh, but fortunately, in the limit where R goes to infinity, I can change this limit uh, into infinity z bar in the direction of the z bar. So here, this limit becomes infinity. And then this part becomes purely uh, analytic in z. So this part will become analytic in z. It's not exactly analytic everywhere. It's piecewise analytic. It's not analytic over the branch. Uh, on the branch curve, it's not analytic. But at least piecewise analytic. And it's piecewise analytic over this uh, outside contour, which can which we can deform into this gamma. So the gamma is the contour of this uh, orthogonality with respect to this analytic measure, and the contour is going through each point one by one, a one to a two, a one to a two, a two to a three, and back to itself by rotating the origin once, exactly once. So that's the contour. 
and the measure is given by this one, which is the measure that I give before. And so, so far it's just changing the uh, uh, planar integral into, the, uh, into this integral, but it doesn't show uh, the orthogonality. The orthogonality should be something like Pn of z to the power zk with respect to some measure has to be uh, zero, right? That's, so we want to find such measure for, for k less than n. But here now, k is over here, so it's not yet uh, multiple orthogonality. So we need uh, for further steps, a little more steps Yeah, little, uh, little more steps here. So, uh, yeah, if you look at uh, this part, so that's what is sort of an, uh, an, uh, orthogonal, orthogonal with the orthogonal polynomial because after integration, you get zero. Right? So for k less than one, you get zero. So that part is orthogonal. So I consider uh, all the part, uh, the space of this orthogonal part. So I re rewrite this part here. So for all the k less than n, uh, any element in this span will be orthogonal to pn. So this is the orthogonal to pn with respect to a certain measure over the contour. Over the contour down. And here, this is spanning uh, the polynomial of degree n minus one. And I can rewrite such thing in terms of this shape. So any polynomial can be written uh, in this way. So I'm, I'm looking at the case when you have just uh, three charges, three charges, then I can write the polynomial basis in this form, S minus A1 bar to the power N1 and power N2 N3. As long as the power N1 plus N2 plus N3 is less than N minus one, that's also another way to span the same space. Consider all the possible M1, M2, M3, that's the same space. So the reason I like that form is because then uh, if I use one of this polynomial and multiply this uh, function by Z, then that's the same effect as integrating the polynomial inside by S. I mean, taking the derivative of the polynomial by S. So again, Using the integration by parts. But if you take the problem was if you take the polynomial uh, derivative of this uh, inside of this one, then it doesn't stay in this span. It goes somewhere else because W of S, if you take the derivative, then uh, whenever you have um, non integer power, you get uh, something. Uh, uh, yeah, e yeah, even integer power, you lose. Uh, some factor of W, so you, you don't stay in this uh, space. Uh, you cannot, after taking the derivative, uh, it will no longer be, uh, no longer have the factor of W. To get, to compensate this thing, I added several more factors of the W, such that even after taking the derivative, you still stay in this span. So by multiplying Z, uh, it, it's same as taking the derivative of uh, one of this polynomial, and uh, which means um, you can generate this space um, not by by selecting only some of the elements and generate the other by multiplying z. You can uh, select some of them and multiply by z. For example, just select these three cases. This is just three elements from uh, this span. And then you multiply z from zero to a uh, certain number, then you can actually help, uh, generate the same step. And this is orthogonal to p on z, which means uh, p n of z is orthogonal to this measure uh, with respect to uh, degree n, n minus n over three, and with respect to this measure with the degree n, n over three, and so on. So, so that's uh, the proof of the orthogonality, multiple orthogonality. Um, just to say you have five minutes left, okay? Right. So, yeah, but 
people usually don't want to go into the Riemann Hilbert analysis. So I think it's good. So, uh, yeah, so let's just briefly go to the Riemann Hilbert analysis or. Okay, so yeah, uh, briefly go to the Riemann Hilbert analysis. So, Riemann Hilbert analysis, I, the starting gamma was to have to go through all the points and coming back after rotating the origin once. That's the, and the, and after finding Sego curve, I have to deform the gamma such that it's actually going through the boundary of the Sego curve. So, given A1, A2, A3, A4, you can find the single curve, as multiple single curve, as this. And then you, uh, original curve was something like this, that's the gamma. Then I can deform this gamma into this form that goes into the single curve. Whenever the point is inside the single curve, then I have to come back to pick up that point and go out, come back to pick up that point and go out. And this coming back and picking up the point, uh, that's, uh, that's necessary if, if the charge strength is non-integer. If it is integer, you can ignore, you just uh, place the contour around the origin, that's it. But uh, if it is non-integer, then it's essential to come back and pick up because there's the branch cut coming, coming from this point. And then uh, we already know the, know the uh, equilibrium measure, which means we know the G function. Knowing the equilibrium measure means knowing the uh, G function. And uh, the G function is given by what we actually uh, use to define the multiple single curve. Multiple single curve, we have log of Z and real part of uh, A L A H Z of Z. And these are the exactly the G function. So exponential of that is Z to the N, which is uh, here, the inverse of that is here. And exponential of that uh, for the exponential of um, this is what my definition of EJ. So this is the G function. So uh, this is the G function outside the multiple single curve. And each planar region, I put this uh, G function. So that's the first approximation of this, uh, this uh, solution. So if you uh, so you have the solution to the riemann hilbert problem. If you multiply uh, this uh, inverse the effect of the G function, that's the first approximation. I need further uh, thing over here, uh, but that's basically uh, give you the uh, strong asymptotics. Yeah, I think I have to stop uh, here. So ah, yeah, the important thing is the uh, coworker. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yes, questions, please. What was that? The next thing to do? Uh, the next thing is uh, so we you know, uh, want to calculate the partition function. Partition function is uh, using this uh, Jimbo Miwa theory, uh, you uh, obtain from uh, one two entry of this solution, right? So we have to look at the one two entry of the solution to calculate the variation of the partition function and uh, sort of proving what uh, Nixin and Alfred did for this general case. So could you just say in summary, when you have, the only data you have is the location of these uh, logarithmic uh, charges and their strengths. Yes. So how do you read off from that data what the multiple measures are? Oh, yes. Uh, multiple measures can be written uh, just uh, immediately. So, uh, yeah, yeah. so these are multiple measures given by uh, location of AJs. And this part contains the CJs, 
big W contains the CJs. And there's nothing else. So, okay. yeah, so yeah, multiple measure uh, is piecewise analytic function. Yeah. yeah, but if if all the CJs are integer, then it's just analytic. Analytic okay. with some poles. So the, the punchline is that you've got this multiple orthogonal polynomial, mm -hmm. which somehow is also an ordinary orthogonal polynomial with respect to your plane two dimensional measure. And yes. its zeros give you the locus for uh, uh, yes. the good curve? Yes, zero uh, locus is given by uh, Sego curve uh, here. Okay. Doesn't show up here. Takes time, doesn't it? Each picture. And what exactly is it that satisfies the Pan Levé equation? It's not the partition. Is the partition ah, function yeah. a Pan Levé tau function? What, what comes in the, what comes, when, when does Pan Levé comes? For example, Pan Levé 5 comes when two of the points is very, very close. It's scaling as one over square root of n. It's the distance. Some sort of critical phenomenon. Yeah, it's a critical phenomenon. If two of the points is of the, uh, of the same order as the interparticle distance, then the screening doesn't work and you get uh, Pangneve five local parametrics to describe the local zero also, and also and also if you calculate the partition function, all all the quantity will be related to Pangneve five. So similar, very similar Riemann Hilbert was used in the merging of uh, uh, the particles on the uh, unit circle. Toplitz case. So merging of toplitz, uh, they get the similar Pangeve 5. Uh, yeah, so I'm using those results from Tom Clay. So since my co worker Meng Yang was in Tom Clay's place, you know, he found this reference. Maybe just one little clarification. So it seems that your CJs are not scaling with the uh, capital N. With ah, the, uh, yes. the CJs, minus. in this case, not scaling. If you mm -hmm. make the CJ scaling with the number of charges, then, uh, then you get this one, where it's very interesting, uh, actually, what I'm doing with Meng Yang in uh, sort of uh, next program. It's a long program, but uh, in this case, you can create a uh, cusp singularity. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the most simple way you can create cusp singularity. So you can calculate the correlation function. That's the goal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And do you have any uh, hope to find the equilibrium measure these uh, domains kind of in general, or that's that's still uh, just- Not gen general, generally right? something in this way, I don't think the general way is hopeful. Uh, I don't, I'm not hopeful, just mm -hmm. case by case. So for this case, equilibrium measure can be uh, calculated. Even in here, in this equilibrium measure, the locus is not given by some formula. It's, it's just proof of the existence of certain curve. Mm. So these are not these segregate curves, these, uh, this, no. uh, okay, exactly. this is a different, uh, different yeah. Okay, but if you if you perturb this by another CJ, for example, some small uh, oh. CJ, then you will create some other uh, hole here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Very good. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so I see no other uh, other ones coming. So thank you very much again. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll have one more seminar in this sequence uh, for uh, the third semester, and then we'll uh, uh, go for the uh, well-deserved uh, uh, holiday, Christmas break, and then we'll reconvene in January. Okay. So see you next time. So the same link all, hold all the time. Yes, it does. Yes, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, of course, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Join us. Join us. Thank you.
Okay, thanks. And we'll see mm -hmm. you. Bye bye.